Well, we're going to go ahead and get started and hopefully some folks will uh, be coming in. <clears throat> so uh, without any further ado, we will start the video and run through it. And if uh, people are not here, we'll put it up on the YouTube channel. In this segment of our study of contemporary culture, we're going to turn our attention now to humanism. We've already looked at secularism, and we've looked at existentialism, and now we're going to turn our attention to humanism. Now, humanism is a very ancient philosophy, and one that has gone through all different kinds of stages and transitions and changes. And it's very difficult to define humanism because it's such a broad philosophy and has so many different elements to it. And we must be fair when we're trying to define any kind of philosophical system, lest we uh, come at it in a simplistic way and distort it. But one of the big problems we have with humanism in understanding is, is that it's often confused in people's minds with another word and another concept in our culture. Do you have any idea what it is? Humanitarianism. Exactly. Humanitarianism. So many people use the term humanism as if it were a synonym for humanitarianism. Now, humanitarianism just simply refers to a concern that people have to care for the welfare of human beings. Anybody who cares about people and who does things to help uh, the cause of people could be called a humanitarian. But humanism, uh, humanism seeks to be humanitarian as well. But humanism as an ism deals with a philosophy that is much uh, more defined than just simply having a care or concern or the welfare of mankind. Judaism cares for human beings. Christianity cares for the welfare of mankind. Even communism as an ism has, at the heart of its philosophy, a concern for the welfare of mankind. At least uh, in, by philo philosophical design, communism seeks to be humanitarian. People differ radically as to whether or not it succeeds in its uh, humanitarian uh, considerations, but at least it professes to be humanitarian. But humanism is a philosophical system, not just a concern or attitude toward the well-being of mankind. It has, as I mentioned a moment ago, a very long history. And we usually trace the beginnings of humanism back to ancient Greece, to the pre-Socratic philosopher whose name was Protagoras. Protagoras developed a concept of humanism which he set forth under the motto Homo Mensura. 
Homo Mansur. And the reason why I bring this in is not just for the sake of ancient history, but because this motto that Protagoras introduced has become kind of a rallying cry for later generations of humanists. And what the motto, Homo Mensura, means is man the measure. Man the measure. And the idea behind Protagoras' development of humanism is simply that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things things. Man in himself is the ultimate norm by which values are to be determined. So that man becomes ultimate for all intents and purposes and autonomous. That is, man is the ultimate being and man is the ultimate authority. That reality and life centers upon man. So, in terms of humanism, as a philosophy, we use another word that uh, is somewhat uh, technical, and that is that humanism is anthropocentric. Anthropocentric, what does that mean? Centric, what, what do we get from centric? Center. Center, and anth what's anthropology? The study of man. It comes from the Greek anthropos, which means simply man. So something that is anthropocentric would be centered on man, or man-centered. Christianity, on the other hand, we say is theocentric. That it is God-centered. In the Christian faith, God is the absolute being, and God is the absolute authority. So we can see, just in this difference, in terms of where the center of focus and concern is, a built-in tension between Judeo-Christianity and humanism. Now, it's, this may get a little bit complicated, but historically, as humanism developed older, more ancient periods or, or, or varieties of humanism did not deny the existence of God. So that we have seen in history forms of what may be called theistic humanism, where there was a belief in a God. But God's activity, uh, for the most part, is restricted to uh, being the creator of the natural realm and the natural forces, and that religion that came in to uh, older varieties of humanism came in through the door of what we would call naturalism. There is a God, yes, but the, it's not a supernatural God who is involved supernaturally with this world. Okay? So that earlier forms of humanism acknowledge some kind of power or force for which or from which nature comes. But the center of attention and the center of value has always been man. Man is the measure, not the character of God, not the being of God. And there's a sense in which humanism has always involved us with a conscious alternative to thoroughgoing uh, supernatural Christianity. So the humanism um, manifests itself as a, a consciously as an alternative to Christianity. Now again, I want to be fair, and in a, such a brief period of time we can just skate lightly over this, but as I said, there are all different kinds of humanists. There have been optimistic humanists, pessimistic humanists, uh, uh, benevolent humanists with respect to uh, the church and religion, militant humanists which have vigorously opposed any kind of even the existence of Christianity. And I want you to note, just in passing, that the rallying cry of contemporary humanism tends to be much more militantly opposed to the church 
and to Christianity than earlier varieties. For example, we go back to the 16th century. And we, uh, if I can use as an image or as a symbol to indicate the struggle that was going on for men's minds in Western civilization in the 16th century, I think of the great debate that went on in that period between two titans, two intellectual giants who represented, on the one hand, humanism, and on the other, Christianity, biblical Christianity. Who were those two figures that really... Uh, carried on the debate so uh, lively in the 16th century. Does anybody know? Erasmus of Rotterdam, okay? And who was his uh, antagonist? Martin Luther. Martin Luther. I, knew, I knew if there were a Lutheran in this room we would be able to get this. But Erasmus was uh, considered the prince of Renaissance humanism. And he, uh, uh, as a great scholar, as a great uh, humanistic thinker, also had a, uh, a motto. And his motto was ad fontes. You can't take this course without having a, a refresher uh, course in Latin, can you? Uh, ad fontes. Does anybody know what that means? Hmm? Two something. something. We got the first word, two. All right? Fontes. Come thou font of every blessing. All right. What English words? All right. Fountain, spring, quella. Okay. Got to get the German in. It means simply to the source or to the sources. And what happened in the Renaissance was, why is it called the Renaissance? What does Renaissance mean? Renew. Renew or rebirth. It was the rebirth of what? The rediscovery of what? The, of learning of what learning? Cultural, the great golden age of ancient Greek culture. And so there was a rediscovery and a, re, uh, a renewed vigor and interest in studying Plato and Aristotle and the great minds of antiquity. So here, Renaissance humanism went back in history and tried to discover the highest expression of human culture and give its rebirth to civilization. Now, Erasmus uh, was its leading spokesman in the 16th century, and what people often overlook is that even though uh, Erasmus was a satirist, and wrote very satirical essays criticizing the Roman Catholic Church, he still was a member of the Roman Catholic Church and included in his philosophical system the importance of religion. His call ad fontes, ad fontes to the sources, was not just a source to renew the study of Greek and Roman theory, but also to go back to what other sources? The Judeo-Christian sources. He was the one who was carrying on the movement to recover the ancient languages of the Bible. In fact, Erasmus, the humanist, was the single most important individual for the reconstruction of the Greek New Testament in the 16th century which came to be known as the Textus Receptus, which was the Greek text. This is why I'm bringing this in here. It was the Greek text upon which what version of the Bible was, was based? Does anybody know? The King James. The King James Version of the Bible was built upon the Textus Receptus, which was reflected largely the brilliant work of Erasmus. But you see, for the humanist, religion is just basically one input into the general growth and development of the human race. Religion is part of your experience, and, we, and part of what it means to be human is to be involved in some kind of religious aspiration. And certain values come to the race through religion. But there's no commitment there in terms of the absolute authority, for example, of the Word of God in the life of people. So 16th century 
humanism sort of embraced to a degree features and values from the Christian community. But a titanic struggle emerged, as I say, in the 16th century between humanists and Christians. And the, uh, uh, the symbolic spokesmen for that were Erasmus and Luther. And I think we can say that in the 16th century, the battle was won by Luther and the Reformation. By the 17th century, the tide began to turn. And as we go into the Enlightenment, into the 18th century, we see that humanism begins to prevail over the Christian faith and the Christian church as a dominant cultural influence in the shaping of men's ideas, in the shaping of what we call the modern mind. Now, it's important for you to understand that because you are living in a culture that in a certain sense reflects the renaissance of humanism. You are living in a culture where you are bombarded every day by values and ideals and concepts that come out of humanistic philosophy. And you need to be aware of that as Christians, because Hello. keep in mind, as I mentioned, yes. this fundamental point of antithesis that exists between classical humanism um, and Christianity between that which is anthropocentric and that which I is theocentric. The, is, um, the uh, 19th we're century we're all, um, manifested a movement of another kind of link-up or cooperation between religion and ancient humanism. And we see it particularly in the school of thought in theology that is called liberalism. Now, I always hesitate to use that word for this reason. The word liberal or liberal is a perfectly good word, you know. It means one who is free thinking, one who is open, one who is uh, uh, scientific and, and uh, and responsible, a person who is tolerant, and all of those things which we would regard from a Christian perspective as being virtues. Hmm? But again, liberalism of the 19th century refers to a specific concrete movement within theology. And, and, I, and I hesitate to use the word because everybody in this room has a different idea of what it means to be a liberal. There are all different kinds of liberals, and there's all different kinds of liberalism. But when we're talking about liberalism in theology, we're talking about a distinctive movement where we saw an attempt to reconstruct Christianity on a basis of naturalism, to extract from the New Testament anything that was of a supernatural flavor. Miracles the resurrection, the atonement of Jesus, the transfiguration, the virgin age. For some reason, everything seemed to focus on the debate over the virgin birth. But the debate on the virgin birth, for example, was not a debate over one small point of the Christian faith. It was a debate in principle. It was a debate between supernaturalists and naturalists over the uh, incarnation of Christ. Okay? And that just seemed, seemed to be how the issue became public was over the debate on that point. But the, the, but the debate in the 19th century was far bigger than the question over the uh, mode of Jesus' birth. It had to do with the clash between thoroughgoing supernatural Christianity and those that wanted to reduce Christianity to its social and ethical considerations. Emil Brunner the 20th century, neo-Orthodox theologian, the Swiss theologian, one of the most important theologians of the 20th century, in, in writing his, his massive work on the person of Christ called the Mediator, he makes the statement in there that 19th century liberalism was, in Bruner's opinion, nothing more and nothing less than unbelief. 
Uh, it's important that, 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 that it's Bruner that says that and not Sproul because Sproul's a conservative and he uh, embraces classical orthodoxy. Bruner didn't. Bruner wasn't uh, carrying a brief for classical orthodox Christianity, but he said this kind of Christianity, 19th century liberalism, is basically unbelief. But here was the crisis. All of a sudden, people came to the conclusion that the Bible, for example, did not come by way of divine revelation, but simply reflects primitive man's self-understanding of their religious experience and of their values. And it's interspersed with all kinds of saga and legend and mythology, as we would expect to find in primitive people, in a pre-scientific culture. <clears throat> so, a whole school of scholars came to the place where a crisis happened. Now think about this crisis in practical terms. They no longer believed in the miracles of Christ. They no longer believed in the resurrection of Christ. They no longer believed in the virgin birth of Christ. And that, that creates a crisis, doesn't it? Because historically, the church is built upon their outspoken commitment to a supernatural God, a supernatural Christ, who is born by miracle, who dies a death that is of cosmic significance in atonement, and who is raised from the dead. The New Testament itself says, without the resurrection, your faith is, is futile. Your faith is an exercise in futility. So Paul grasped that as early as the first centuries. He says, take away the resurrection, it's the end of the church. Now you have a group of theologians in the 19th century who no longer believe in the resurrection. What do you do? What do you do? We have an institution that is part of human culture. It's established, the church. We have, you know, literally thousands, tens of thousands of churches across the Western world. We have billions and billions of dollars invested in these institutions. Not only that, but we have a remarkable platform from which to bring about social change. And what kind of social change? What kind of ethical problems? The very things that Jesus of Nazareth was concerned about. So in the 19th century liberalism, we saw a shift of concern from personal, supernatural redemption, you know, redemption from your sin and alienation from God and all of that, to what was called the social gospel. To extrapolate the teaching of Jesus ethically from the supernatural background of the biblical documents. They said, we don't believe the supernatural, but we still believe in the values of the New Testament, the ethics of the New Testament. So the church still has a raison d'etre. The church still has a viable ministry to carry on. So, all we've got to do is just change the message and change the structure. Now, not everybody in the church accepted that. There was a fierce battle, you know, the so-called modernist controversy that grew up in the church with liberalism. Now, but the point of this discussion is not on liberal theology, but to point out that at this point, humanists and liberals became allies because humanism of the 19th century variety still saw religion as valuable. Not necessarily valid, but valuable, insofar as that it called men higher and upward to higher virtues. Because the humanists embraced very important virtues uh, in, I mean, the, in their uh, commitment to human dignity, they believed in compassion and service to mankind and virtues like honesty and industry, hard work, freedom, democracy, so on. All of these ideals of the humanists were also ideals of the Christian. And so there was a point of contact a point of cooperation. Remember I said a little while ago that modern versions of humanism 
tend to be more militant. If you would read, for example, the first, second, and third humanist manifestos, particularly the third, second and third humanist manifestos, you would see that in those documents there is a virtually vitriolic spirit of hostility and antipathy directed against the Christian church. A growing militancy against Christianity. Why? Why the change from a cooperative spirit, disagreeing to disagree about the supernatural, but at least working side by side for human dignity, for uh, hospitals, for orphanages, and all of that sort of thing. Well, thinkers along the way, men like uh, John Dewey, okay, came along and said, what religion does is that religion tends to hinder the evolutionary progress of man. The humanist dream is to rid the world of pain and suffering by the efforts of man through education, through technology, through industry, but principally through education, through higher education. And religion tends to keep people in a conservative frame of mind, holding on to outmoded and antiquated values. It tends to make people conservative rather than progressive. And at the heart of humanism is the commitment to progress. And religion is said to hinder that. Now, in the moments I have left, let me just try to draw a little graphic here to understand what the struggle is with humanism in our culture from a Christian perspective. In terms of Western humanism as we know it today, we can say that, that in many respects, the ethics or the values of Christianity were borrowed by the humanists and ripped off the Christian foundation, which was the character of God and the person of Jesus Christ. See, I believe that it is important for me to be compassionate to the sick and to the poor, and that I have a duty, a moral obligation to minister to those people because, first of all, God commands it. And second of all, Christ has redeemed me and has repeated that commandment to be involved. But what happened was the foundation was negated by the humanists, and the humanists tried to retain the ethics. And so we say the humanist lives on borrowed capital. He rejects the foundation upon which his very values are established. As Francis Safer says, the humanist has both feet firmly planted in midair. And my biggest complaint about humanism, I voice it again and again, and I'll voice it one more time, is that the humanist, being anthropocentric, has noble ideals, but he has not an ounce of rational foundation for them. He tells me that man is a cosmic mistake, as we mentioned the last time. He comes out of nothing, he goes to nothing, but in between he's the creature of supreme dignity. Humanism is intellectually untenable but it is emotionally very, very attractive. Why? Because we are anthropoi. We are men. We are women. And we want to believe that life has some virtue to us. But to the thinking person, humanism gives no reason, ultimately, for ascribing virtues and values. They become, in a word, preferences rather than principles.
And dear friends, that's exactly where we are with modern sophisticated versions of humanists who come right out and say, that's what we have. We don't have any principles. We don't have any principles. We have preferences. All right. My fear of humanism is that when preferences become ultimate, then the question is, whose preferences become ultimate? And historically, that has, in every case, ended in some form of statism. And the focal point of my concern as a Christian is at this level, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it and I know it'll be controversial, is that the principal vehicle for the dissemination of humanist philosophy is the public school system. That has always been the strategy of the humanist. He says that the only way we can progress is by education, and if the humanistic philosophy is going to shape the values of modern man, it must capture the institutions of education, and it has done a masterful job of it. And I say to the Christian, who's finally, after decades, finally beginning to wake up and see that what your children are being taught in your homes and in your churches is one set of values, one philosophical system, and what they get by public education is another. That's becoming crystal clear now with the debates that are raging in the country, but it took a long, long time for the Christian community to begin to understand that. Now, we'll talk about education and the culture as a separate item later on in this course, but I just mention it in passing now that here is where the battle lies, in the battle for the modern mind. In our next session, we're going to consider that philosophical movement that is original to the United States, which is called pragmatism, and we'll take that up the next time. Well, apparently there were some technical issues of people getting into uh, the session. So we will continue this as a uh, recording and it will be up on uh, YouTube uh, shortly. Find it interesting that this series was done in 2003 and RC talked about uh, towards the end of this of the uh, of, of progressivism and uh, it's what we're seeing today tw uh, almost 20 years after RC uh, felt that this was a, a real problem that we were facing. Well, how have classical humanists managed to maintain a link with Christianity claiming a, harmoni a harmonious relationship? Uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, they claim the same virtues that, uh, uh, that we do as Christians, but humanists do not uh, have the same foundation is what the problem is. The humanist claims, uh, how do we, we counter that from a Christian point of view? Well, of course, uh, as a Christian, we believe that the foundation of all things is in the scripture. And uh, as the humanist thinks that man is the measure, the Christian believes that as the first catechism, uh, quite shorter catechism question asked, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So the counter to the humanist uh, is basically the fact that we are to worship God. That was the whole reason that, that uh, 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 Moses was taking the, uh, the, the Israelites out of Egypt was so that they could worship God uh, in their own land. Uh, describe the influence of humanism on the Western culture. Um, we know that uh, there's been a big change in the culture, and as, as, as we don't have any absolutes, then people are able to pretty much do their own thing, 
and they don't they don't have anybody to answer to they don't have anything to answer to uh because that foundation is gone and uh uh so that that people can pretty much decide what they want to do and how they want to do it and it doesn't matter if they keep the rules because they don't believe there are any rules and uh so this is a real problem <clears throat> what should be the response of Christians to a pervading humanist worldview? Well, of course, um, we need to always be putting out there the fact that uh, our lives are centered in Christ. Our lives are not centered in ourselves. And we need to be understanding, as R.C. talked about, the character of God and the person of Christ. We need to keep those at the forefront of what we are talking about. All right, here are, some, uh, here are some questions. Humanism is a philosophy that has arisen in the last 500 years. Wait a second here and get your chance to uh, uh, think about that. The answer to it is false. It goes clear back to Pythagoras, uh, pre-Christ, pre pre-birth uh, pre of Christ. Pythagoras' uh, concept of humanism, homo mensura, means what? Man is the measure. Man is the measure of all things. Um, it, it's all about man and uh, being the center, really being the center of the universe. Humanism shares none of the same goals as you, humanitarianism. Does it, it shares none of the same goals. That's false because humanism does share many of the same goals as humanitarianism, just the same as the Jewish faith, um, uh, Christianity. Um, all, all, anybody can be a humanitarianism a humanitarian, because that is taking care of the needy. Humanism is a philosophy. So there, uh, that's the difference between the two. Humanism and religion coalesced in the 19th century to form what? Theological liberalism and let's be clear here that when we're talking about theological liberalism we're not really talking about uh political liberalism although now humanism has not only uh leaped from theological liberalism into political liberal liberalism but it is uh, uh pretty much driving uh the uh all liberalism Humanism is anthropocentric, man-centered, and that's true. Well, that brings us to an end this week, and um, we will, um, uh, I will get this posted, uh, and next week we're going to take a look at pragmatism, which is a philosophy that really has its roots in the United States. It's the only philosophy that has birthed and come to fruition um, in, the, in the United States.